All right, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those who may not know me, my name is Treyon White. Uh, I serve as the council member right here in the great Ward 8. Uh, happy to serve. Um, we have had a lot of fruitful discussions about positive thinking, up mobility, and, and breaking uh, generational curses. Um, today, we're going to have a lot of fun. We have some special guests here today with tonight. Uh, to talk about some different topics about, you know, uh, ownership, about investing, about financial freedom, about mindset, about changing habits. Um, and so we're excited about the work we're trying to do in the community and hope to create a new movement and new conversation. Uh, I'm highly controversial and I understand that I get that, but it's all to create new dialogue, new conversation within the community to change the paradigms, the thinking, and the process of how we normally operate. Um, and sometimes I refer to it as stinking thinking. Um, but I always say that uh, if you do the same thing, you'll keep the same results. And that's the definition of insanity, to do the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome. And so tonight is going to be a lot of good conversation, good dialogue, and most importantly, information. Um, access to the right information at the right time could change your life. And to, tonight, we hope that you just don't tune in for the sake of tuning in, but you're taking notes, uh, you, you're asking questions, you're intrigued by the conversation, you're following up, um, and your life has changed. That's the ultimate goal, because I can talk to JD or Don um, anytime one-on-one, -on -one, but I decided to create a platform um, to create some dialogue, some information, and some education uh, tonight. Um, we've been having a series of, of webinars, Zoom platforms about uh, the violence in the community and just trying to change the narrative from, from violence to talking about public safety mm -hmm. and what we can do to empower each other. Uh, Jews, mute your mic, please. Um, talking about empowering each other within the community. Um, and we're here tonight joined uh, by great friend of mine's uh, brother James Dunn, also known as JD. In fact, you can turn your mic on, JD. I learned about you from uh, some good men in the community. My, br my brother, Kuwap from Up Congress Park, and also JV, or AKA Freeze, uh, uh, Sean. Uh, mm -hmm. So you came highly recommended by some solid men, man. And they said you the guy to talk to, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. They been kind with their words, but. Uh... Oh, yeah. trying to uplift the people, man, you know, trying to change this cycle, man, break this cycle of dysfunction when it comes to our people and trying to uh, do anything that I can do personally to uplift our people. You know, I come from the same streets as everybody else, and uh, I had to work on self to break this cycle, so now I want to give back. So, so J.D., real quick, is it okay to call you J.D.? Yes, sir. Okay, so you're official, official, uh, a voice for financial literacy um, and just giving advice about stocks. Um, and I'm not saying you're here tonight to give advice, but I wanted you to share about how you got to where you are. So you said you come from where everybody else come from. Give me a little bit about yourself and your background and, and how did you get to this point? Uh, like I say, I was born and raised three generations in D.C. You know, my grandmother was born in D.C. My mother was born in D.C. I was born in D.C. I grew up uh, in mainly in uh, Northeast and, and, and D.C. and, and, and Northwest. Um, like I say, I went to uh, Taft Junior High, graduated from there, went to Eastern and McKinley Tech, you know. Uh, oh, you went to Eastern, man. It's in Blue Night, man. I don't know nothing yeah. about Eastern and McKinley yeah. Tech, man. That's, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. uh, you know, I'm born and raised. I know, you know, everybody from my ear pretty much you know, everybody know each other. And uh, I met a lot of those good brothers you mentioned along the way, some of them childhood friends, and I met some of them along the way. Um, this is something that I was always infatuated with, you know. Um, I wanted to be uh trade for a living. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. It started 20 years ago with me taking uh my first uh, financial literacy class that mainly just dealt with institutional investing um and it started from there and i just became an avid reader um 
of uh, multiple ways to make money in the stock market. Um, and I'm still a student of the stock market. I still yeah, right. read. So let, me, I, let, me, let me start right, right there real quick because, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of conversation right now um, around investing, around diversifying your portfolio, stocks, bonds, uh, options, annuities, retirement, you know, a lot of big words, right? And you might have some people that's joining tonight uh, that's, you know, maybe going through a financial struggle. And I read a book a while back called uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that book uh, yes. by Robert Kiyosaki. And it was a part of that book where one of the fathers was saying to his son um, that I can't afford to invest. I got too many bills. I got too much to do. And I don't have the money to invest. Well, the other father who was in the same situation at the time mm -hmm. uh, pretty much said, I can't afford not to invest. And we look in the, in the book down the line and see where they were financially 10, 15 years from now. One had a, a owner's mindset. One had a worker's mindset. And they end up, they end up transferring the information knowledge into the two boys in, in, in the book. And so what do you say to uh, a person or somebody in general that has come from humble beginnings or maybe working a nine to five and trying to figure out a way to free themselves financially? Uh, how, how did you get started investing in the stocks? Um, first of all, it's like you said, uh, you got to start one step at a time, you know, knowledge is power, you know, so we got to break, like, there's a lot of myths when it comes to the stock market, you know, we have been conditioned to think that the market is risky, but if you look at the history of the stock market from its inception, it has always gone up, even through the great pullbacks it has, it continued to go up, it always recovers. So um, I had to break myself from that mindset to thinking that the stock market was risky. I had to also break myself from being an instant gratifying type mindset, like I'll get rich quick scheme, you know. Um, so yeah. and then we had, like I said, we had we got to be better stewards of our money. You know, um, I'll be reading information all day. Uh, I was just recently reading some information about um consumers in the United States, you know, uh, African, African American, we are number one when it comes to apparel and services, you know, the number one consumer, but when it comes to, uh, housing, <laughs> we last, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, investing, we last, you know, so I believe in, and we, we all have some funds laying around that we, could invest, but we choose to do other with. So that's where being a good steward of our money is very important. So, so some of the times people get stuck about, you know, they hear about the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones and Wall Street, and it seems like enormous. It's just too far away. Uh, what some of the platforms you say to a person that's just getting started? Uh, what platforms do you suggest to use? Uh, I know I, I posted something the other day about people standing in front of a store buying shoes. It was highly common. being sued or in a paper or controversial for someone just starting out what's some trusted platforms you would say to use or, or how to get started or where to go uh td ameritrade okay. charles swab uh it's just like opening a bank account anybody who's ever opened a bank account you can go online and open up an account with one of these online brokerage accounts and sign up and open it the same way you would do a bank account i mean how much like would you suggest I don't have a suggestion when they only an individual can determine that, you know, because of their uh, situation, you know, whatever your situation is, I just would advise you to get involved. You know, um, there's multiple ways to make money in the market and you can start with $50. You can start with a dollar. You can start with a hundred dollars. You can start with a thousand, whatever you have at your disposal. That's like, we eat out a lot. We buy clothes, materialistic stuff a lot. I, I don't believe that nobody, you know, like we can find some money to, to start this fund. And right. like I, I say, I, go ahead. I just know that we are very resourceful people, man, in our community. Mm -hmm. And we make uh, we make different priorities about what we want versus what our needs are. 
Um, and I just want want to know from you. I know you have a full presentation. I want the audience to know that uh, what you do, you do um, for a living. You do on a regular basis. You know, you've been doing it for 20 years, man. And so you have a wealth of knowledge and experience, right? And I know you want to get into your presentation, but I do want to know from you, uh, there's a lot of conversation that's going around about uh, the cryptocurrency. Some people say to invest in the traditional stocks. Uh, some people say invest in cryptocurrency. Uh, a lot of people are into the day trading. What is the difference between the three? And what is, what is your take on all three different modes of investments? Okay. Okay. Just don't go off what others are saying. Uh, I, if I gave you something and I said invest in this, I would hope that you would read and do your own investigation. You know, that's the first thing. You know, we've been uh, conditioned to just, you know, go off with somebody sell their mouth. You know, uh, as far as cryptocurrency is concerned, um, you know, the big thing is Bitcoin. You know, you have a lot of different uh, platforms to invest. Uh, and that, you know, um, day trading is, is simply someone who gets in when the market opens and gets out before the market closes. Okay. They day trade. So that requires a lot of time. And yeah, so I understand that a lot of people don't have that time, right? So you have to figure out what your objective is first. What am I trying to accomplish, Right. So, because a lot of people don't have the time to sit in front of a computer all day and trade for a living, and it takes money to do that. Excuse me. It takes money to do that, and uh, so first of all, you have to figure out what your objective is. I understand that everybody doesn't have the time to invest, so I would advise them to get involved, even if it's just investing in a mutual fund, a fund that can grow your money for you over time. You know. Um, the option market is something else. It's more risky. It's more, uh, you have to really have more education pertaining to what they consider technical analysis, which is being able to read charts to invest and, uh, and so forth. So, like I said, um, there are different ways to invest, you know, um, but my thing is to get involved and to, to start making a conscious effort today to change the trajectory of your family's tree. You know, um, it starts, it starts with, with, with the adult, the parent, you know, making a conscious effort to say, I'm going to change my family tree. I'm going to start doing this today. I appreciate that, man. And we're going to go into detail. I know you have a company called save and serve LLC. How can people right. reach you to, to buy in or to, learn from what you're trying to do uh i think i uh i, I did did i give them a uh my card okay we, we have your card but you can I just reach out to me you can give them my email address my what email address james t as in tom done d-u-n-n zero zero at gmail.com say it again for me one more time oh we got it in the chat go yeah. say it again for me one more time James, that's it. The, the S was met, missing off of that. They just showed, but it's James T as in Tom Dunn, D U N N, zero zero at gmail.com. I want to share a quick story with you, brother. Uh, how I really got uh, interested in stocks and trading was my sister. Mm -hmm. My sister Tiny, she came to me and she was telling me about uh, Bitcoin. Right. I'm like, man, you don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. And I look up today, I was looking at it today, and it's at $49,000 per share, man. Yeah, per so, coin. Yeah. A coin. Yeah, per coin. Yep, you got it. That's why you're the expert and I'm the, I'm the novice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell me, are you involved in, in exchange of cryptocurrency at all? And what's your take on that? This new book? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm invested in, in Bitcoin. Uh I do it. Hey, listen, it's a simple. We all know Cash App. You can buy a portion of Bitcoin through Cash App. Right. All you gotta do is say uh purchase Bitcoin and whatever you allot. 
purchase, you can buy it. Uh, you, a lot of people don't have the stomach for the up and down gyrations of the market. So you have to ask yourself, if I invest a hundred dollars today and I look up tomorrow and that hundred is fifty dollars, what am I going to do? Yeah. It's right. only a loss if you sell, if you get out, you incur the loss. You have got to have patience with this stuff and been able to sit in it and be patient and believe in what you're investing in. Do you believe Bitcoin is going to be around in the future? That's what you got to ask yourself. When you read the news today, you see major people like Elon Musk talking about he invested $1.5 billion in Bitcoin. You have professional athletes talking about you can pay me in Bitcoin. Yeah, so I was reading something. That's that's interesting. I, I saw Kevin Durant was talking about it too. Uh, not too long ago, I was reading something uh, with Warren Buffett, who also graduated from these public schools. People don't know that he graduated from Wilson, went to middle school to Alice Deal. Uh, he rem he removed some of his stock from investing in banks and put a lot of it in IT companies, man, about a week ago. And that drew my attention, like, what's going on? And right. I started paying attention to that, man. Uh, so do you think it's a new move heading to IT and to the cryptocurrency that's, that's going to be beneficial in the future? Of course, you know, if you do your research, they say that the two fields that are going to be recession proof in the future is IT and healthcare. You know, um, those are the two fields that they are saying in the future are going to be recession proof, regardless of what's going on in the economy. Those fields will continue to, to thrive. So. That makes sense when you see somebody like Warren Buffett start to shift his money from these banks, and 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 the people will become more aware of banks. Like banks are really frauds. Yeah, you okay. know. What do you They're mean? Really fraud. Fraud. What, is, what does that mean? Tell me what that means. Well, just think about it. if you had ten thousand dollars and you put it in the bank, they won't give you anything in interest, right? Well, zero zero zero, 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 zero point zero one percent. Right, which is equivalent of uh, one dollar probably, yeah, on your, or, or ten dollars on your on your. And they taking right. your money, and making more money, right? Right, and then they're gonna loan your money out to yeah. somebody and charge them twelve percent. Yeah, yeah, right. So, and then your money is not even offsetting inflation. Inflation eats up four cent on a dollar every year. And the way they doing this stimulus and pumping it is going to is going to go move more faster. So your money has to be outperforming inflation. And I just was reading that they uh, the, the value of the dollar is decreasing by the day as they continue to uh, pump money. I saw pump money into the economy, and I saw uh, the, the president uh, uh, sign a bill for for the stimulus yesterday for twelve hundred dollars. Um, yes. And I, I want I want to pause for a minute. And I want you to go into your presentation real quick. There are a lot of people asking a lot of questions. What books do you suggest? Uh, where to start? What websites do you go to? Uh, those types of questions. I want you to be able to answer that in your presentation. So I'll digress and swing it back to Wanda and Jews. Uh, for those who are chiming in on Facebook, uh, Jews, type your questions in the comments on uh, on this platform, Zoom, so we can see and hear what you're feeling in the audience. I see right here we have 106 people watching through zoom and probably a couple couple of more through instagram and facebook but go right ahead man okay like first of all empowered. i just want to say uh breaking the cycle what does this consist of and it consists of getting better students of our finances and uh so how do we do that you know being financially literate um so i got this piece up here it says financial literacy is the ability to understand how to make sound financial choices so you can confidently manage and grow your money. When you're financially literate, you're able to allocate your income toward various goals simultaneously, not just to ongoing expenses, but to savings, debt repayment, and a rainy day fund. You can navigate the financial marketplace with self-assurance, and you have the tools to thoroughly research things like loans, credit cards, and investment opportunities. So this is what financial, being financially literate means, to 
be able to do these things. And this is how you will break the cycle of dysfunction when it comes to poverty and so forth. We have got to be take that first step with the parent, the adult, that understand that what's important. Like you were saying, a pair of shoes are not important. What's important that my kid grow up and have a better life than me. Right? So let's talk about love. We say we love our kids. What does love really mean? When I think about the true definition of love, which is agape love, it means self-sacrificing for the other's concern. So self-sacrificing for my kids. Right? So this is what we have to start doing. Sacrificing for our kids. Okay, you can go to the next uh, clip. Okay, we hear the term trust fund, baby. And I don't know, a lot of people know, a lot of people may, may not know what a trust fund baby is. And right here I have a definition. A trust fund baby is someone whose parents have placed substantial assets in a trust fund for him or her. While most of us have to support ourselves once we reach adulthood, trust fund babies can often live off the income from their trust funds. They can start assessing the money once they hit a certain age, often 18, or once a certain event transpires, such as the benefactor's death. Money in the trust must be managed by the benefactor, a third party, or eventually the child. And I'll just stop right there on that. This is what I'm talking about, right? Us as parents taking the first step and putting vehicles in place so that our children can have better lives and also teaching them how to be responsible with finances so that they don't garnish or be bad stewards of the funds that we left them. So now the big question would be, well, how do I start something like this? <clears throat> so I'll go to my next slide because I know we got another presenter and we'll talk about that. What I have here is an example of a fund. And if we blow it up, it's, it's, ex, ex, it's simple as this. These mutual funds, just think about people who work for 30 years and when they retire, they have a, a bunch of money that they take takes care of them in their retirement, usually through an individual retirement account, some type of 401k or pension. Right? So how... So where did that money go? When you work, you allot a certain amount of money to your uh, retirement account. A lot of us in our communities don't do it because we feel like we need our money now. Right? So what I have here, I just want to look at the part. If you can look at where it says five year after tax return of $10,000. So this means if you had your money in this fund right here for five years, after taxes, that 10000 would be 24000 And that's what's just putting a flat amount of money in there. That's not even talking about adding to it monthly or weekly or whenever we got paid. The second point I want to look at is the year down here. This is what residual income will be created. If we go back to 2017, it shows you what the fund did for that year. And right here, that fund did 31%. So that means that my 10,000 made 3,100. That could be supplemental income, right? That's just on 10,000. But most of these people have 100,000 or hundreds of thousands or millions in these accounts. So if I had a million dollars in that account, that would be $310,000 that the fund did that year. And I can choose to take that. I can say, well, give me 100000 of it and keep the rest in there and let it continue to compound and grow. And as you look, they break down each year for you. And each year is going to differ. I'm not going to say and tell you every year the, the returns are going to be the same. They're showing you right there that they... They don't. But the, it's better than a bank. Let's talk about what we just talked about. 
If I had 10,000 in that bank, what would I have? And most people think it's complicated or it's, it's very simple, right? Up here at the, up under, it says minimum investment. $1,000. You can start this fund with $1,000. Okay, somebody may say, well, I may not have $1,000. If you do your investigation, there are funds out there you can start with $5, $10, $100. And once you learn how to pick good mutual funds, I hate to say it, the average person that I ask who works that has a 401k, when I ask them what type of retirement fund they are investing in, they usually don't know. If I ask them what type of returns are they giving, they usually don't know. We have got to take, we have got to wake up and take over our finances. Because a lot of these jobs are in partnership with a lot of these funds, but the fund is trash, man. The fund may only be returning 5 or 10% a year, which is not bad is giving me a return, but there's some funds that give you 30 and 40% a year. So we have to learn how to take advantage of this information and use this information to grow our money and put things in place. So if I was doing this for my kid and I started these when they were a baby, they wouldn't, they would start life in college with no college debt. They'd be able to buy their first home outright. And then they would also have something in place that's going to continue to create residual income for them. It's going to differ, but they will have something in place. So, like I said, I don't want to take up all the time. I hope I enlighten some people with this information. And if anybody have any questions, I'm pretty Thank you, JD. Real quick, um, uh -huh. one of the things you talked about people in the working class, right? Right. And oftentimes I see, you know, um, Ward A has uh, a population of working class people, and I see mothers, right? We uh -huh. have predominantly African American women, um, 83% single parent households, predominantly ran by African American women, right? And I see uh -huh. them busting their chops every day. But the reality is, I've never seeing someone working two to three jobs uh, ever get financially free out of working those jobs. And so what do you say to a, a mother or father It's a disciplined individual. I'm, I'm going to keep it real. You know, uh, we have got to break ourselves. We have to be we have to learn to control self. You know, we are our biggest uh, adversary sometimes, you know, because we don't have the discipline to do what it takes to break the cycle. Well, right. And I think that for us, we become. Because we, wanna, we we like to look good on the outside, but you got uh, we got we got the Fendi, the Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Prada. Why is that though? Yeah. I, I I wanted I, to touch well, on that a bit. Why well, is that? Well, well, I know for me it was not is now, but it was a self esteem thing because exactly. I know. Right. We had to learn how to compete with words and action right. and culture but as a grown up with responsibilities uh my mindset has to change and our mindset has to change and we bring up the next generation man right. and i watch a lot of the younger guys in the community burn and give up their futures all because they want a new pair of shoes or a belt or some glasses or whatever popping the show that they have money but you look at it you know they don't have they don't own it but like i mean like you said i think it's three things that that contribute to that and i, I think one is upbringing Okay. has to do with it upbringing uh two is low self-esteem right and three is insecurities you know 
we as as an adult, we have to talk about these things to our kids so they they don't fall victim to that. They have learned have to learn how to be uh have strong, you know, not to be insecure, right? And to be secure in themselves and understand that materialistic things don't make me. Right? So this has to be taught. That's the upbringing part I was talking about. You know, we have got to communicate with our kids. We have to stop letting social media raise our kid, TV raise our kid, the music raise our kid. All of these things are misleading. You know? Go ahead. One of the things I think about, man, is is, uh, delayed gratification. And that's one thing people don't want to practice, man. I think that, you know, we want it and we want it not now, but right now. Exactly. And I think that hurts us in the long run because, you know, I had the opportunity uh, to to uh, take money and, and invest it, but I chose to do other things with it when I was younger, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, I had a couple of dollars and I chose to, you know, travel, do other things, but I figured if I had the right information, and, 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 and contrary to popular belief, uh, J.D., I learned something. It was about Donald Trump, man. And uh, people, uh, just, you know, it's, it's a hot topic, but Donald Trump taught me something. He had a book called uh, "Why We Want Why We Want You to Be Rich" by Donald Trump and his Robert Kiyosaki. It was a two author book, and he said that uh, he said that people that don't have money don't have the right information because you the more you learn about money, the more that you're gonna make money. How you gonna make your money? Make money for you. So when right. I talk to somebody who don't have money, I clearly know they don't have the information about how money works. Right. He was, like, was like, man, the people that have information on how money works, they know how to make their money grow. And I right. was like, damn. I said, I don't got the right information. Exactly. You know what I'm I was like, I ain't, I ain't around the right network. I, and they say, you know, that your network, your network is your net worth. Mm-hmm. So I think that was like something I learned early on. I took that quote and I wrote it in a marker on my bedroom wall in a marker so I can see and vision it every day. About how and the more I learn about how to make money grow and make my network, my net worth, it is found in my mind. Prior to me becoming a council member, you know, I, I always was a read, uh, an added, an adamant reader. And so, right. if you have any books you suggest that people get into to learn more about stocks? One of the books that I would advise people to read that will help you break the mind to change your mindset about money is uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. Okay. That was one of the books that one of my mentors gave me early in my life, you know, so that I can understand the value of money and what it takes to be successful, right? Or to just be financially secure. It ain't so much about being rich or anything, but just to be secure and know that my bills are going to be paid, food and shelter, first laws of survival, you know, are going to be taken care of, right? Right, right. Uh, uh, A beginner's stock market book, is uh, How to Make Money in Stocks by William J. O'Neill. Okay. That was one of the first books I read. He's the uh, person who started the IBD newspaper, which is the Investor's Business Daily, which is a straight stock market paper. Okay. One of the most powerful papers out there when you learn how to navigate this newspaper. Um. Those are two books that I would, would advise people to, to start reading. Um, and I mean, with with the internet and YouTube, start using the internet and YouTube to educate yourself self instead of entertaining yourself. Yeah. You know? I, I, I tell my children that all the time, man. They, they, you know, because my children, two, their, their rooms are kind of all over the house, right? And I don't know what they're doing for a couple of hours. So sometimes I pull them in. I'm like, man, what y'all been doing all day? You know what they're doing. Fortnite. Yeah. You 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 know, I grew up in I grew up in the Sega and Genesis era, man. You're a little bit older than me, right? Right, right. And, you know, we 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 I, when I got older, we had like Black Planet, MySpace. And mm-hmm. we used to play, you know, Tech Mobile, all, uh, all them type of games, right? And right. I'm noticing now that the children are watching YouTubers play the game. They're not even playing the game. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things we're doing in Ward 8 is we're we building a couple of new wrecks and we're retrofitting those wrecks because it's money and gaming, right? Mm-hmm. 
just like I hear the uh the, 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 sh the people who buy the shoes, they say they reselling shoes and the shoe game, and there's so many different ways to make money. And so we're trying to capitalize on empowering them to learn how to be on the selling side instead of the buying side. Because as you said, man, we consume, consume, consume. Yeah, that's true. We 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 if we come if we really start doing what we need to do with our money, we could become a, a great people. Man, you know? we're spending one point two trillion dollars, man. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the people, man. Yeah. That's true. That's true. We just gotta be like you said, knowledge is power, man. Yeah. You know, we have got to take the time to invest in our future by reading and educating ourselves. I mean, if you could just dedicate an hour a day, read something that's meaningful. It's going to educate you, you know, and uh, get involved. The biggest lesson I had to learn with the market is all the books I read, they, they tell you about opportunities that exist, right? Yeah. But they don't. They leave out intricate information. But the only way you're going to get that information is through experience, man. Experience is going to always be your best teacher. And I, I know you got to go, man, but I wanted you to share, man, what some of the ups your highs and some of your lows that you had with investing, what you learned from that, man? Uh, well, when I first started, my goal, see, that's what I talk about figuring out what your goal is. My goal was to get a 10% return on my money a month. That's what I was trying to do. And when I first started, I started with $3,000. I had read some books on options, and I was like, well, with options, I can sell options and make uh, money selling options and I was just trying to get 10% a month yep. and uh, my my high was I did it for 11 months consistently I was profitable and I started with 3000 I turned it into $7,000 my low was I sold the wrong option because what I didn't know which what I learned later on from one of my mentors was you never put all your money in one trade mm. I used to put all my money in one trade, right? You're only supposed to put 10% of your money in the trade. That way, if the trade go against you, you still got 90% of your money to invest, right? So, so I put all my money in my trade. Okay. And when I woke up, that 7000 was 2200 <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. 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 Right? So I stopped trading. You was dizzy when you woke up. Yeah. So I stopped trading. I got me 12 <laughs> new books on options. And I said, I'm going to read one of these books a month because I'm missing something. Wanda, mute your phone, Wanda. You know, so uh, I started back reading because I knew it would work because it was working for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But I just I just was like, man, I'm missing something. I'm missing something. And by the grace, I, I met a good brother who taught me technical analysis, which, which is using charts to make my trades all. And uh, so far, so good. It's been, it's been like I say, you gonna have you gonna have losing trades, but if you can you can be wrong seven out of ten times and still make money in the market if you learn how to trade correctly. You know what I'm saying? So well, uh, I don't know if you see the questions right here, brother, but I have a few questions right here. And, and Jews, if you can put them in the chat, that's the ones that's on Facebook because I can't uh -huh. see those. But it, uh, it says that uh, um, one of the questions says, what type of investment do you recommend? This was from uh, Gene Mans Mansell. Forgive me if I mess your name up. Uh, what type of investments do you recommend for someone who may be starting out later and maybe in the mid-50s? Um, like I say, first thing you need to figure out what your object, what are you trying to accomplish? Do you know? Um, it's never too late to start investing. I don't use that as an excuse. Right. You know, um, there are multiple ways to make money in the market. Um, like I said, um, it's all about what your objective is. And only he can answer that. You know what I'm saying? Only he can answer how much he has to invest and what his goal is. I, my thing is I advise everybody to at least get a mutual fund. I just showed you what a mutual fund would do with your money. That's every five years. So next time, that tw I showed you what 10,000 did in five years went to 24. So in five more years, that 24 is probably going to be 50 or 60,000. So you took an initial 10,000 investment and in 10 years it went to 60,000. 
And you talked about compound interest even in that. So right. keeping it in there, they continue to build and grow. Exactly. I see exactly. Wendy Glenn said, how do I begin to read and understand my 401k documentation documents? Uh, can I set up an appointment with you? Can you explain it to me? Uh, she even <laughs> her cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, most of them send out a, a annual a report or prospectus. And they'll talk about what they're investing in, what they're putting new money in, and what the returns are, what their fees are pertaining to uh, managing your money, and so forth. And like I said, you can Google anything that you don't understand. I mean, that's how I learned. That's how I learned a lot of stuff. If I don't understand, I Google it. I go to YouTube. When I first started investing on TD Ameritrade, I didn't know how to use the platform. I you I sat in the house one Sunday. And just watched it all day. Yeah. You know, the information is out there. You just have to want it. I see someone ask uh, about diversify, diversify fund. You know, are you familiar with that? Say that again. D diversify fund. Um, diversify fund? Yeah, Miss Phyllis Hurst asked about that. Yeah. What is she asking? Uh, what do you think of it? I think all investments are good. Once again, all, all investments can't be good, man. All, if you are investing in the markets, you see yeah. what I'm saying, and you do your due diligence and investi investigate them. Yeah. I, I, I'm not against diversifying your money. You see what I'm saying? I'm not against that. Like I said, there are multiple ways to make money in the market. Do I know every way to make money? No, but I know a few enough ways to make money where my money is growing for me. For me, it's not sitting in nobody's bank. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, do your due diligence and investigate whatever it is. The information is out there. And I and see some people in the chat giving some advice mm -hmm. um, around uh, around what they're saying. Multiple ways to invest, make money is ETFs, mutual funds, stocks and bond options, um, Roth accounts. I see. I saw a lot of conversation about the Roth accounts. What is yeah. a Roth account and how can you... Uh, a, Roth, a Roth account is strictly a fund where the average fund allows you to invest without the money being taxed. So if I make $100 before taxes, they'll allow me to put that $100 in there and it's not taxed, right? But when I start to pull that money out of my retirement account, they're going to tax, tax it, okay? A yeah. Roth allows you to let the money be taxed in the beginning going in. So when you start to pull it out, they can't tax it, which makes more sense to me because I'm going to be older. I'm going to be retired. I need all my money. So I don't want you taxing. I allow you to tax it going in. Okay. That's the difference between a Roth and a traditional uh, 401k. Um. Or IRA individual retirement account. I also saw someone say that TD Ameritrade gives you uh, two hundred thousand dollars of play money to uh, learn as you learn how to trade. That you kind of like a, a yeah. stimulation, so you can learn as you grow and understand. Exactly, why you're losing your your own personal money. Exactly, we got a lot of knowledge. Well, the I see. You know, we and need to start sharing that information. Man. Yeah, you know, start sharing that information. That's right. They'll let you practice trading. If you want to invest, learn how to invest, and want to start investing, they'll let you use that play money and act like you actually really trading with it. I see Taisha Jones said, my husband and I started investing in stocks through Cash App and Robinhood. We we own uh, several stocks now, and we only put in about $20 here and there. So I guess they're just dropping some in. Every once in a while, it's kind of th put away. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like I say, I've always, always asked people, you got to have a, a, when you start to individually invest in stocks, you got to have a strong stomach for that. Yeah. Because you have to be able to stomach the pullbacks. But as long as you know that three out of four stocks follow the major indexes, which are the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500, if they are down, three out of four stocks are going to follow them. Ain't nothing, no news in them. Ain't no news in the news about the company. It's just that the market is pulling back. And you investing in good companies, sit still, man. 
It's going to go back up. Any last words for the audience, man? Tell, first of all, tell people where they can find you. What's your name? If you got social media, email real quick before we uh, go to our next uh, person on the panel. Yeah. Uh, like I said, my email is jamestdunn00 at gmail.com. You can hit me on my email. My uh, my Instagram is guru option seller. Okay. Say it again for me. Guru option seller. All right. Cool, man. I know you have developed a class as well. And right. what you're going to roll out in the future. We look forward to hearing from you. Um, and get, get and sharing with the community because you know a lot of people keep their information and they keep it in their chest, and because they people practice that, other people are unable to benefit because it don't hurt you none to share the information. Um, exactly. So I know we contacted you uh, and you got right on. You come highly recommended by some credible men in the community. So I want to thank you, man, for joining us tonight, man. Uh, keep sharing the information and keep empowering people through investments and just changing mindsets and changing generational curses man thank you brother i appreciate y'all having me man and it's a blessing man like i say i'm all for the empowerment of our people man and, and, and changing and breaking that cycle man so that our futures can be bright man thank you man stay on for a little bit if you can cut your screen off there's some questions in the comments and you can go through and try to answer some of the questions um i know okay. you're not giving direct stops to buy but if you right. can you know, talk about what worked for you to be beneficial to the audience man Okay, will do. Thank you, brother. Y'all have a blessed evening. You too. All right, all right. Uh, for those who are just joining, um, today is a great day to change your mindsets, your habits, uh, and your spending power. Uh, the future is in your hands. You got the opportunity not just to affect your life, but your children's children's children. Um, they say people all over the world want to change their circumstances but are unwilling to change themselves. You want your future to be brighter. You want your community to be brighter. brighter. You want your family to be better. You got to start with making yourself better. And that's a hard thing to do. Because the older you get, the more you get stuck in your ways, your habits, your ideology and philosophies. And some of we learn, learn behavior. It's on us to break those curses. And no one coming to save us but us. And so we have a phenomenal guest coming up, uh, Mr. Donahue People Sr., is Donahue ready? I don't see him. Let me text him. Uh, we got two Donahue people. We got Don Jr. and we got Don Senior. I understand Don Jr. will be on the Zoom uh, next week um, as he continues continues his father's legacy. Uh, where are we? Wanda, where is Don? We're reaching out to him now. He's not on. He's dropped off for a second. We're trying to get him back on. Continue to ask your questions in the comments. Brother JD, James Dunn, he's in the comments answering. Uh, while, we, while we're doing it, I want to share a quick story. Um, at the age of, uh, 24, um, I was going through a lot of hardships and financial tribulations, you name it. I had it. I want to tell you how I knew because I had a, uh, a Lincoln town cop. I think my, I think, you know, my registration product was expiring. It wasn't going to pass inspection again. I was going from bank to bank, just struggling financially. And I was serving in the community in a nonprofit field, working in, the, in the, working in various communities. And I remember because I used to, I, I knew that when, if you had a dollar on in your bank account, you can fill up your gas tank off a dollar. And I was just using up all my cards, filling up my tank so I can at least get to work or get to the community to serve, man. And I made a decision, man, that I had to do something different. Um, and I had to, uh, and, and, I, and I was, I was uh, going to Soul Factory. And I didn't have no money to put in church, right? And I felt bad. And I, and I wrote on the envelope, I got too much brilliance and too much information not to have a dollar. And I wrote on the envelope and I said, I'll never be this broke again. And I 
and I turned it, turned the envelope, and I remember Michi, he was sitting beside me, he talked about it to this day, and I had a whole row of mentees beside me, and I made a decision to change my habits and mindset, um, because I didn't want to, you know, be in a situation where I'm 35, 50 years old, still struggling, and the next year, I bought a house um, in Southeast Washington, D.C. at the time, I bought the house, actually, one of my friends, Charles, uh, he went to Blue Singer High School. He was a real estate agent. I bought his mom's house. Mm-hmm. And I bought the house for $200,000. Now that house right now is worth $475,000. And I made that decision with my credit. I think at the time I had like a five thirty, five forty, dollars um, And I bought that house. And you can just see what, what the house is worth four seventy dollars right now in the southeast Washington, D.C. And I also look fast forward to 2020. In 2019, I made the same decision again. I wanted to buy another property, a bigger house, a five bedroom, six bedroom house. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. And at this time, I had a five something credit score again. And so I consulted with uh, uh, Imani. I consulted with uh, um, Ashley, who all both have financial literacy and credit companies. And they helped me get on work on my credit. And on my daughter's birthday, July the 10th, 2020, 10 years later, I end up buying uh, my second house, but third property. Um, and it, and it's, it's about building wealth. And it's about believing you can do it before you can do it. You know, sometimes it's a, sometimes we stuck and working paycheck to paycheck and struggling. Um, we don't know if we can do it. or We don't know the programs that are out there. They got HPAP. We had a seminar about home ownership. Um that we opened it up for, we tried, we thought we were trying to get a hundred people to join, you know, we just trying to get it going and 500 people joined the conversation with industry experts some government agencies, some nonprofits that had a plethora of money and resources to help you buy a house. If the house costs uh, $400,000 that they can give you mm-hmm. up to $80,000 to purchase that home. And at the time I bought my house, one of my friends, Quasi, bought his house also in Ward 8. And he was, and he bought a house for the same price. He was paying eight hundred dollars a month for his property because he took advantage of the programs. And I didn't initially get in get in those programs early on because I didn't know about the programs. Actually, but I ended up buying a house along my way to doing it. Let me uh, see where are we um, with Don. Let's call him up. You got a FaceTime, man. First time, Miss Phyllis Harris said the first time home home buyers program is wonderful. I know they have several here in the ward. We talk a lot with uh, Lydia's house. Um, you should look them up. If you have others, please list them in the comments. Uh, so I can um talk a little bit about that. And you know, my 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 trajectory changed in investing in properties. Even at the time, I still didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I was going to the closing, praying that I could still get the house. Because I didn't even know what they was going to require of me because I didn't have any money. You know, they said I needed uh, 3% at closing. And, and I, uh, actually, D.C. Housing Finance Agency, uh, I qualified for one of their programs. They gave me money to go to closing. But I didn't get HPAP. And I, at the end of closing, they ended up giving me a check with my keys. I took a leap of faith, man. Hmm. Mana. Okay, I got man. I took a leap of faith. HPAT, Habitat for Humanity, Knock NACA. Um, you should be researching these these options and building wealth. And I can tell you that when I first bought my house, my mortgage was originally uh eleven twenty a month. I see a lot of people taking their money and dump Ward A has 73% of renters in Ward A. And I can assume that everybody on this call or on this Zoom lives in Ward 8. But just think about that. If you're at, if the, the lowest rent you're probably going to pay for a two-bedroom in D.C. is $1,200. The average two-bedroom in D.C. is $2,200 a month. Please know that. And so if you pay $1,200 a month for a year, for 30 years, because think you got to live somewhere for at least 30 years if you're alive for 30 years. 
you're going to pay over four hundred thousand dollars in rent just think about that you're going to pay over four hundred thousand dollars in rent that you're going to take and put equity in somebody else's property and then when you move out and i, I noticed because I, I i lived down the street right here and i had a, i lived in two bedroom apartment that my grandmother uh had us living in my mom lived in and um we we was paying five hundred dollars a month five hundred five fifty that same apartment going for twelve fifty right now all i i I went in there property probably about 10 years ago now, eight years ago now. All I did was paint the walls, change the bathroom, and change the kitchen. And it's the same exact apartment. I'm like, man, come on. Come on now. And so it's on you. You got to think renting or ownership is just two different mindsets. You can pay $1,200 in mortgage. Or $1,200 in rent. And some people say, I don't want to get a house. It's too much responsibility. I said, nah, that's just an excuse because you're afraid. You don't have the right information. You're not empowered. You know, you you, you got to start speaking positive thoughts. You, you can say, I, I can't afford to buy a house. But the reality is you got to start saying, I can't afford not to buy a house. Because the reality is you're going to have to live somewhere. And then I think about the house I'm selling for over $400,000. I'm getting all, all the money back I ever paid in mortgage since I lived there. I'm getting that money right back and some win win and i didn't know what i was doing when i bought it equity. i didn't know all this stuff it's I called equity and so who's that chairman in jews yes i was thinking i didn't know if you wanted to be out here as a lone ranger by yourself <laughs> i've always been a lone ranger but you know you, you, you can't join the conversation to hide now if you're gonna hide we're gonna okay reach. i'm gonna i'm gonna come in so I so, went I went through HPAP. I went through the HPAP program and had a really great experience. Um, so I'm I'm actually in the pos in, in a position to purchase my first home. Um, I used Lydia's house to uh, get qualified for HPAP, and so you have to take two classes. The first class is a two hour course, and then your second class is a four hour course, um, and they walk you through the 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 complete home buying process, what all the terms are, um, you know, they help you understand like the language and kind of how everything goes about. And it's not difficult. Um, and so I encourage everybody to sign up, you know, the one thing so let about me ask you this, how long did the course take for you to do it? And are you doing it? Did you have to go in person? Are you doing it virtually? What, what happened? So I did it pre COVID. So it was all in person, but now they are doing everything on zoom. Uh, so when you register, you're able to do it virtually now. And so it didn't take long. Um, once I registered for the class, it, you know, I was right there. It took me, it was like two weeks before the class started. And then your next class comes another like two weeks, two, three weeks after the first class. Okay. Um, and what did, what, what, what did you need? Like, did you have to have a lot of money? I'm not going to ask you how much money you make. But no, no, no. So you don't, well, I work for the council members. So <laughs> We're public servants. Um, you know you work at DC Council. You yeah. don't make a lot of money. Yeah, that's it's public that's record. You don't stay long, so we try to keep you as long as we can before you. <laughs> before I blow up. So no, you don't need it for. First of all, you don't need any money to purchase. I mean, to go through HVAP. Actually, you can just come in, and I suggest people go through um, who feel like they're not ready because you don't know what you need to get ready. And so this course allows you to understand what it is that you need to do to put yourself in, into position to purchase a home. So the, you're going to work with a housing counselor. You're going to be assigned a housing counselor. And that counselor is going to walk you through each step to say, okay, your credit report shows these three things. You know, you may need to work on getting these things out of debt. I know that I was personally worried about student loan debt. You know, I had a lot of student loan debt coming out of college and I thought that was going to disqualify me. A lot of times, council member, you know, we will disqualify ourselves before we even jump into the game. And right. so it really takes, you know, you have to take a chance. Like you said, you know, you didn't know what you were doing when you bought your first home. You just kind of jumped out there. So I thought student loan debt was going to hold me back when, in fact, student loan debt didn't matter to HPAP. They didn't care about it. And so they were, you know, it was just something that they put aside. So they look to see what's on your credit report. Um, and then they put you on a financial plan. They put you on a budget and say, here's how you need to start spending. Here's how you need to start saving. And the best thing about HPAP is 
you don't have to have any down payment money. So when you go to the table, so I was going to ask you, because uh, a lot of people feel like you got to have 20,000, 25,000 to go to closing. Um, how did that affect you as far as you searching and trying to buy a house? It didn't affect me at all. In fact, they tell you that at minimum, you need to have $500. Now, I would encourage everyone to who is purchasing a home to save their money and to get themselves on a really um, uh, a dedicated savings plan. I think JD talked about this, you know, discipline is everything and having financial discipline is what a lot of people don't want to do. When you start thinking about how much money you spend at Starbucks or how much money you spend eating out every night, um, you know, if you look back at your returns and you're thinking, wow, meals and entertainment, you spent, you know, maybe $20,000 in meals and entertainment for the year. That adds up. If you're spending, you know, $100 a week on just fast food or eating out or drinks or, or you know, you're spending $125 to pop a bottle of mo, that money, um, you know, is, is really being spent, you know, stupidly. In fact, you should be putting that money to the side. And so I put myself on a dedicated savings a pl savings plan. I save a, a, a certain amount of money every month. I have it directly transferred out of my check into a different bank account that I do not touch. Well, I, I know who to get a loan from. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so I put my money up and I don't touch it. Um, I don't even see it, right? And so even if it's, I just say, even if it's $100 that you put aside every month, put that $100 aside and don't touch it and let that start to grow um and you'll start so, seeing your money so one another thing we have is acorn from hpap we also have ehot yep for those who may be dc government employees yeah and they can um, they can qualify for up to uh, i believe it's fifty thousand in um, financial assistance so you can go to the table with fifty thousand dollars of government money to help you purchase a home they have ehap um they have hpap they have dc open doors um, DC Open Doors is a great program that your lender will walk you through. I mean, I, I encourage all DC residents to go through these programs to work with, um, you know, lenders who understand these programs to work with real estate agents who understand these programs. Um, so if you're interested what in the agent do you use? Uh, Ramona Barber, the Barber Home Group. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that was your agent as well. So um, yeah. she she did our, uh, our Ward 8 Home Buyer Seminar and she's, you know, really, um, She's such a great real estate agent because she really understands the market, specifically here in Ward 8. Um, and she's, you know, she's a novice at working with first time home buyers. So it's been great working with the Barber Home Group. And I think that I wanted to share also one of the pieces of legislation I'm working on um, with two, two different programs. One is around displacement free zones. Mm -hmm. And this is that because, you know, there's a lot of development coming east of Anacostia River. And Ward A, we're probably going to have between 10 to 15 billion probably in the next five to 10 years. Um, and you know what happens? The price of living goes up and the people who are here in the long run through the struggle get pushed out. And so one of the things we're doing is just creating this concept that's not new to me or DC, but it's called uh, displacement free zones where mm -hmm. we freeze the taxes in and around areas hardest hit by development. I don't know about you, but I just know in the last three years, uh, my taxes went up uh, 11%. So it was about extra 200 some $300 a month. Absolutely. And, you know, not everyone has that. And so we also, hold on, here's Don, people right here. Okay. Don, where are you, man? Hello? Hello? Technology. Hello? Don, we got to get Don some better technology, man. All that money, I didn't even research it, Don. Don, all that paper he got, man, he got to have a better tech team. Yeah, you know, one thing they talk about um, in terms of building generational wealth is really real estate. I know a lot of uh, leaders, you know, especially uh, Don, you know, being getting into real estate, you know, that's a lot of our white counterparts. That's how they have uh, been able to transfer wealth is through property. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I read an article, I guess, two years ago now that uh, in Washington, D.C., the wealth gap between blacks and whites is 81 percent. Wow. 81 percent higher. Hold on one second. Don, where are you, man? Okay. 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 All right. All right. So, Wanda, we got to send Don the right link. He said he's looking at me, 
but he can't get on. Can you invite him in? It may be several. Can can you see him? He's on. The I or you want to send him your link? I already sent him my link. He said he's on my link, and he is looking at me, but he can't see himself. And then I'm counting him about his technology. Or well, let me look and see if he's under your name. Yeah, he's definitely under my name, Wanda. Well, I was looking at, I didn't know you sent him your email. I was looking under Don. So, no, he's not under your name either. All right. So, so I want to thank the audience for your patience. Uh, this is our... Uh, <laughs> I'm sending it, Juan, I'm sending it to your uh, 320 number. Sounds great. I'm going on mute so I can get them in. All right. Gorgeous. I'm sorry I cut you off. No, um, I'm actually going to, I want to switch a little bit, switch gears. I started trading options um, a couple oh, yeah. months ago. Yeah. You uh -huh. know, uh, Rodney was making oh, me man. jump into the market. So I definitely started trading options. Um, I use TD Ameritrade. So it's, it's real easy. So just to give the audience a little step by step, because I know everyone's talking about how do I get started. And so you can set up a, like a dummy account, a play account with TD Ameritrade. Right. And so you'll, you know, put in all your information, you'll set it up. You don't even have to set up your bank account right away. Um, and I would encourage everybody to either use that or to use something um uh, you know, Ameritrade's a little bit advanced, um, but it's it's really good if you have somebody to kind of help you. There's tons of different groups, trading groups that are on like Telegram. Um, so you can find your network to really get started. Um, YouTube, go on YouTube, start learning about this. They have like YouTube videos that walk you through literally everything. But when you set up your TD Ameritrade account, it'll give you $200,000 of play money. Um, and actually, you know, me and Tiny, I heard that, you know, Tiny was telling you about cryptocurrency. Tiny was, you know, e texting me like, how much money did you make on options today? So, you know, there were some days where I could hit like maybe two or $3,000. Um, there's a stock called QQQ, which is a bundle stock, which has like Microsoft, Google. Um, it has Microsoft, Google. Um, a, a lot of the big stocks, Apple, everything is kind of all in one. Oh, here we go. We got Jules, do me a favor. Use your phone and do my Instagram live for me, please. Sure thing. Okay, I'm gonna go. Thanks, council member. There, there you go, Don. We 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 thought you uh you know, we know little Don is on a plane. We thought you went and got uh, on your private jet and flew out somewhere, man. We know what was going on. You get unmute yourself, unmute yourself, unmute yourself. I'm at my private club in Miami Beach, the Bath Club. We've got two receptions going on here. Oh, and okay. And outside in our courtyard and on the ocean. So, so you have in the club. Those and, uh, and I've got to speak in a few minutes. So I borrowed the general manager's office to come in and, and talk to you. All right. So how much time you got, Don? I'm, I mean, I'm good for a few minutes. Let's see how it goes. All right. All right. So for those who don't know, man, this is the infamous... Uh, world-renowned Donahue Peoples, man. Uh, you, you born and raised in, in, in Washington, D.C. I know you moved around a little bit, but came back, man. And I, and I read somewhere at the age of 23, you established a, a company called RDP, correct? Yeah. Uh, what, what was RDP? And tell me a little bit about that company, man. If you still can remember, I know it's eons ago, but go ahead. Yeah, no, it was an appraisal company. Okay. Uh, and uh, I did appraisals uh, for HUD and uh, for other lenders, uh, starting off on residential single family um, homes, appraising property for people who were getting mortgages and actually um, more uh, moderate income families. And so and I'm from DC, I was born and raised by and large in DC. And so- yeah, Where from, D? We gotta check your, where, where, where man? Who, who where, where uh, you grew up at? Give us some more information, Don. I was born at Friedman's Hospital, which is now okay. Howard University Hospital. Okay, okay. Um, and I lived in Petworth, um, okay. and on right off Georgia Avenue on okay. 9th between Madison and Longfellow. Okay, so you're an uptown guy. <laughs> I am. I'm Ward 4. Ward and, 4, uh, okay. Went to uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, High School. Oh, you went to uh, Wilson? I was talking about uh, Warren Buffett, who graduated from Wilson also. Yeah, he was a D.C. person. Yeah, I'm, I'm a blue knight for life, so I didn't want to see uh, that. Uh, right? 
play y'all with basketball. Oh, I don't know about that, Don. <laughs> yeah, y'all was good in baseball and soccer. You're gonna keep the you let y'all have that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes football. But when I played, we were good at basketball. Lead a boy talking about go Tigers, uh, HD Warriors. Oh Lord, here we go. So Don, in 2009, Forbes, man, you made Forbes as one of the top ten wealthiest Black Americans, man. Wow, that's amazing. Well, thank you. And my I, goal I is to be, my goal is to be one of the top ten wealthiest Americans. Okay. Um, well, yeah. you, you should be on your way there because I also saw that in, in, uh, in 2015, now correct me if I'm wrong, I did a little bit of research, you know, everything that's on the internet ain't always facts, that you you was worth over $700 million, man. So that was that was a little over six years ago, so I can imagine you climbing that ladder. Is it a B now? To, I don't know if you want to share that information on here, man, but we put the people <laughs> want to know. It's, I mean, look, it's elusive, right? I, 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 <laughs> oh, mean, Lord. I don't count. I only oh. count. My accountants count once a year because I got to report it to my banks and so oh, forth. Oh, so okay. I don't even pay attention to it otherwise. Okay. Because um, I'm, I'm not, in all seriousness, I'm working for something other than that. I mean, I'm work. I used to work for money, and I want to do well, but um, I'm working to change the economic trajectory of our people. And uh, and so the way to, the way I've been doing it is on all of our projects to provide economic and uh, career opportunities for black Americans to work on our projects. And now I launched a fund um, that will provide private equity money to invest in real estate development projects What's for the black fund? developers. So I mean, my, my focus is, it, is and it has been for a very long time, to help empower our people, just like Marion Barry and others helped empower me and people like me. So let, let me say this, Don. I'm, I got my book right here, my Marion Berry book right here. It's upside down. And, and yeah. I, I have a picture in here, right? This picture, this is this day right here. You see this picture at the bottom? I do. I met you on this day, man. You remember this? I remember. I, remember. I was really? in the Marion Berry yeah. office, and you, the, the legendary right. Don Peoples walked in, and I took a picture with of with you and of you and Marion Berry in this, this day right here. I remember. And I think that's Latoya Foster. Uh, and Omar Tyree, you remember that? I do. And so, I do. so some of the people say that Murray and Bray put you on, man. Is it true? Is it false? How did you benefit from the life and legacy of the great mayor for life, Murray and Bray? Um, well, I mean, I, 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 I was in D.C. in uh, 1974. I was 14 years old, and that's when the city got home rule. And so my mother thought I should learn about politics. So I went and volunteered for a campaign for city council. Volunteer, I heard Barrett. that. But go ahead. I worked on Marion Barry's campaign and uh, got to know him and he mentored me and then um, went to college and after and after my freshman year I came back to DC and uh, um, you know work, began to work in the real estate business and uh, and then he got reelected in 82 and his whole message was economic empowerment for black business people and black entrepreneurs and to move black people forward economically and so when I came up with an idea to build this building, 2100 Martin Luther King Avenue in Anacostia, and to help create jobs and economic development for black people, he was on it from the beginning, and he supported me, and I was only 26 years old. I'd never built a building before, and so he took a risk and uh, signed a lease for me uh, where the government would lease um, office space in the building, which enabled me to go out and get it financed. And he took, he gave me an opportunity. And that was what he stood for as a politician. His whole thing was give black people economic opportunities. And as a result, it made him a target, just like Mayor Jackson became a target in Atlanta, just like Harold Washington in Chicago, just like Coleman Young in Detroit. Every black politician of that era, of the 1980s, who were elected to shake things up became a target he became one but i would not be here today i would not be anywhere remotely close to what i've achieved in business if it wasn't for him giving me that start and if i had not gotten going in my 20s who knows where i would ended up being so he essentially allowed you to get a government contract that you leveraged with the bank to use uh to get more money and build your uh, your uh, real estate portfolio yes 
and giving me the chance to build a track record because the excuse that these banks always use for not putting money in black businesses is, hey, you don't have enough experience. And the excuse that governments who don't want to give black businesses opportunity say you don't have enough experience. So, and so he gave me the opportunity to do both while not having either one of those in the beginning. So let me ask you, what, what's the name of the funds you mentioned that you created? It's, 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 it's the People's Emerging Developer Fund. And how can people find out more about it, Don? They can go to our website, um, peoplescorp.com, and then follow the link for the Emerging Developer Fund. And one of the key markets that we're investing in is Washington, D.C. Okay. Um, we're going to do uh, at least 10 deals in Washington, D.C. Okay. I mean, and Washington, D.C. is a mecca of African-American entrepreneurship. But after Barry left, we law, uh, D.C. changed. East of the River was no longer important um, for, the, for the politicians. Um, and economic empowerment of black people took a back seat. And then you went through the Williams administration that changed Washington, D.C. and brought, changed the complexion, literally, of Washington, D.C. Um, and by design, um, so because Barry had made it a more attractive city. Got you. And I see that Reverend Motley talked about the CBA agreement you did for 21 MLK. Tell us what that was about. About providing economic opportunities for black businesses. I mean, straight up, our goal is to provide economic opportunities for black entrepreneurs to grow their businesses, to make money so that we can build wealth. Because far too long, the focus has been on survival and not on prosperity. And we need to focus on prosperity. It's unfair for us to keep carrying the burden of poverty disproportionately. And so we've got to shift gears. And so that's what that's about. And we're looking to do with every project that we do in this country. Right now, I've got $4 billion of development projects around the country. And every one of them has a objective of at least 35% minority contract. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we're fully committed to doing that. Um, and, I, and I think that what that's what, why our people have made greater economic uh, progress is because the desire to transform our community doesn't have the same kind of commitment from the political establishment as it's had in the past under a bearing, for example. Got you, man. We got we have to change that. I know at one point you were thinking about running for for for, for mayor, but you decided not to. Yeah, and I was running from I was going to run for mayor because I'd grown frustrated okay. by how black businesses were, had lost so much ground. And that the current mayor at the time thought we were in a post-racial environment, which we are far from. And, uh, and I planned to run for mayor. Um, and, as a, and, and then my mother-in-law was terminally diagnosed with terminal cancer. So I supported my family and my wife and encouraged um, Vince Gray to run. Um, because I felt that it was critical and still is critical that the mayor of the city and the leadership of the city be committed to writing these wrongs that our people confront. And it's more than just criminal justice reform, which has to take place. Yep. It's more than educational reform that has to take place, but economic empowerment. Black people, we can't keep being associated with philanthropy or yeah. you know, struggle. We got to be associated yeah. with prosperity because we are great entrepreneurs. And I agree with that. I think that we have to get the right information, man. I don't know if you are familiar with the Breakfast Club. I am. Okay, so your name came up on the Breakfast Club, and it was uh, Charlemagne the God talking to the guys who uh, runs the podcast called uh, Earn Your Leisure, and they was talking about the great Don Peoples and trying to figure out because uh, most people didn't know who you were. You know, of course, I know you, and and, and Lord Don is a John Junior who's a real estate guru uh, in this space right now. And I know you're getting a little older, and he's doing a lot of the groundwork, and which we have him on the show next week. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you, you know, some people see you as way up here, right? A billionaire, you've made it. But what do you suggest for people who are starting off that want to get into real estate, home ownership, and investing in those, those types of building a portfolio? Well, I think it comes with the mindset that, one, we are as capable as anyone else and we deserve an opportunity like everybody else. But also that we change our mindset from a survival mode to a prosperity mode. And I think also 
don't underestimate, you know, the power of government. I mean, it is our elected officials who set the rules and they govern what, say, for example, D.C. So the mayor controls land use, the mayor controls, you know, budgets, contracting. And so there's no limitation. If you get a chance, there's no limitation of what you can you, you can accomplish. And I think I am a good example of that. My father, so first of all, my, my grandfather, my uh, paternal grandfather, who I was named after, um, was a janitor in a little town called Emporia, Virginia. Really? My, my, my maternal grandfather was a hotel doorman at the Wardman Park Hotel that just closed up for 41 years. And he had five daughters, and they grew up um, uh, on, off of Benning Road on 8th Street and um, went to Spingarn, all five girls. Um, he raped, my grandmother died when uh, my mother was a you know, teenager. So my grandfather raised his five daughters. Um, they got went and got an education, got a good education in, in public school, and then went to college. And uh, so, but my mother had me at 19 years old, and my father was a file clerk for the federal government. So I wasn't somebody who was expected to do be, be ultra successful financially. But I got a chance, and also I lived at a time, and I don't want to under 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 you know emphasize this because this is very important. I lived at a time when I knew that Washington, D.C. was my city. I knew that I wasn't afraid of being pulled over by the police because the police chief of my city was a black man. Um, the mayor running my city when I grew up was a black man. Um, the city council were black people. So they were focused on advancing economic opportunities for our people. They fought for us. And so I believe that that kind of environment made me feel that there was no limitation to what I could do. And I think today we got to operate from that same perspective. There's no limitation to what you can do. And I'm the same person, a little, a lot older and somewhat wiser, but I'm the same person, you know, that I was when I was 16 years old playing basketball at Turkey Thickets, you know, or going over to Anacostia High School to play ball. Um, so I haven't changed. It's just the, I got opportunities and that is the only difference between me and so many other people is I got opportunities. And I had the great fortune of being mentored by Marion Barrett. And without yeah. him, I wouldn't be here. Thank you, man. And so on a practical level, man, we I don't know if you saw the early discussion with Juice, Jesse, and I, uh, and JD were talking about, you know, just to change the mentality of our people. Ward 8, we have 73% of people in the community who rent every month, right? And they're essentially taking that money and thrown into a black hole never to see it again because they don't have the right information. Um, what suggestions do you have some, for to help someone get more information on what they can do to, uh, one, own a home, and two, invest, and three, invest in real estate, and, and three, invest in stock market portfolio, that whole thing? Well, I think the first thing, I think, uh, you know, council member, you made an important point about home ownership. So if we look at 1968, which was epicenter, of the civil rights movement, um, and you look at economics today, black home ownership rates are lower today than they were in 1968. The wealth disparity between black households and white households has grown. Um, it's worse today than it was in 1968. The income disparity is worse, but it all starts off with home ownership. And so because that's where most Americans net worth is tied to. And so we have to look at what interest rates are historic lows. And that's why there's been so much wealth created even in a pandemic. Interest rates are at less than 3%. When I bought my first house, it was 9%. Mm -hmm. And that was a low interest rate. Right. It was an adjustable rate mortgage. And so today we ought to be looking at what can our dollars buy us. There are programs like FHA loans, yeah. uh, EA loans, and other types of loans. Um, and in the past, and I don't know if the district's doing this now, but under Barry, there was a tenant assistance program for home purchases. So there was money available for down payment money because many of us and many of the people in our community don't have the money saved up for the down payment because they're in the struggle mode as opposed to the prosperity mode. But, but the government stepped in and filled that void. And I think if it's not doing it now, we need to do that. 
But the first line of business to take control of your life financially is yeah. to own the place you sleep at night. So some people say, man, DC is simply becoming un unaffordable, man. You know, and they and they and they have that. And in some some aspects, they're right. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with community land trust. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're doing here in Ward 8 in conjunction with the Levin Street Bridge Project and other nonprofits is basically using the concept around community land trust to buy the land and allow people to buy uh, what's on the land. So the house costs $500,000. They essentially may only have to pay $350,000 to buy the house, uh, but it keeps it aff affordable and perpetuity over time. And, you know, the only downside is that if the house sells for six fifty, dollars you may only get 450 out the house because it's keeping affordable for the next person as the community owns the land for me uh and we want to try to figure out uh there are some who wants to get into investing you know they've, they've saved up they have money uh they want to get into home not just home ownership they may already own a home and property but they want to get into investing and i know you you essentially became a, a billionaire right doing investing for a person just starting now, how do they how do one get involved into investing in properties and owning properties and businesses? Well, um, learn the business. I mean, by reading about it and so forth. Because I was self taught by and large. My mother taught me a bit, but I'm pretty much in terms of development was self taught. So I read a lot and learned a lot and asked a lot of questions. Um, but I look for doing the deal. It was finding a deal and doing the deal. And I think that is the first step. One of the reasons I started this private equity fund, the main reason, is there's less than 1% of commercial real estate executives are black. Right. And by the way, that's let's, let's, let's back up a little bit because you said doing a deal, uh, people may, may not know what that means and what that entails. You got to break it down for us, for us Don. Buying, what type of deal? What, what are you talking about? Buying, buying another house and renting it out. Buying a small apartment building, a four-unit building, renting those units out. But... So real estate, though, is a business that's in, uh, is about leverage. So, so let's pick, let's look at a big deal first. So let's say a hundred million dollar development project. So that sounds like a big deal. It sounds like it would need you need a lot of money to build that. But in the real estate world, if, if the way that white developers operate and operate this way around the country, especially in D.C., they go to a bank like Bank of America or Wells Fargo or whomever, and they go and borrow sixty five percent. And that 65% is $65 million. And the property is used as a source of repayment, not someone's credit, not someone, not the developer's ability to pay it back personally, the property. They look at the property. Then um, that 35% is $35 million. Now, most people would think, hey, the developer has to put up $35 million. That almost never happens. So okay. the developer goes. So that's the concept of other people's money. Yep. So that's where the private equity markets are. So private equity, their funds managed by Wall Street firms and other financial services businesses. And they will then provide 90 to 95 percent of that thirty five million dollars. So let's say it's ninety five percent. And that means that the developer puts in one million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to build a hundred million dollar project. That, so, and then let's say that $100 million project, um, normally a, a threshold is about 30% return on cost. So that would mean that you make 30% more than what it costs to build. So that means you make $30 million. Now imagine for $1.7 million of investment, you get that $30 million. That's the power of leverage. Now, the places that provide that capital, private equity funds and venture capital funds, like what? They, What's the name of? Give us some names. So Goldman Sachs, um, you know Apollo Global, um, you know uh, you know uh, Brookfield, you know Oak Tree. All there's so many of them, and so in this country alone, there is seventy trillion dollars invested in private equity and venture capital, but less than one point three percent of that money goes to uh, people of color or women. So that means that 98.7% of that $70 trillion goes to white men. So there's impossible for us to catch up. But here's the irony. 
public employee pension funds are the biggest investor right. in those private equity funds, right. like DC retirement system, yep. like Prince George's County retirement system, the state of Maryland. And so we, and, and many of the workers who are putting their money into these retirement systems for their retirement are people who are black. Yep. And yet we can't get access to our own money. But worse than that, our own money is used to gentrify our own communities. So until we become literate as to how capital is deployed and say we want capital to be deployed based on fairness. So if DC is 50% black, then the DC retirement system ought to be investing 50% of its money with black businesses, black financial yeah. services. I, I, so, totally, I totally agree with that. I always talked about how we should leverage our relationship with Wells Fargo, man. It's no way we're putting 17, 20 billion dollars into this bank every year and we're not making them uh, support our local small businesses. I started a, a pot of uh, funding for uh, grants for uh, small businesses. Now it's called the Dream Grants. You can find out about it at uh, dslbd.dc.gov. It's called the Dream Grants that come out every year. To It's not a lot of money, but it's a pot of money you put inside to empower growth for small businesses. Um, and you started off on, on, a, on a larger scale uh, Don, take us to a smaller scale. And you touched on a little bit about buying an uh, apartment building. Take a step by step how a person can go about doing that. But you can go and buy, say, a, a, a one to four family apartment project. But before we go there, so I'll do that and then I want to talk about affordable housing for a minute. So, one to four family um, uh, apartment building, um, say, in, uh, uh, let's pick it, in uh, Randall Heights. Um, and uh, let's say that it costs, um, you know, three hundred thousand dollars to buy. You can go with a HUD loan and borrow about ninety-seven percent. Okay. So then you get some friends and family to invest with you because we got to pool our money together and be partners. And put that's what we don't do enough of, man. It's all our minds. It's not enough ours. Right. But well, what has happened is that we have been brainwashed um, by the mainstream white media to see ourselves with limitations on it, to see ourselves as those who are not capable or that we can we struggle or we don't want to work together. And the moment um, one of us has any kind of challenge, there's that jumps on us. If you get out of line, the media jumps on you. That's just that's been the protector of the status quo um, forever. The Washington Post was a status, protector of the status quo and targeted every black politician that tried to change things. But our business, so young entrepreneurs can go out, pool their money together, and they can buy um, a you know a four unit apartment building. But let's think about this: in D.C., for affordable housing, you can build a project with no money, none. Because between the tax credits and the subsidy that the government gives out every year, they give out a couple hundred million dollars to developers to build affordable housing. And some of the housing and, the trust fund money? Yes. And so they deploy that money. And so a developer can build an entire affordable housing complex for, let's pick a number. Let's pick a $50 million project. So you have a pro let's just use your project you're trying to do with the senior home at 2100 MLK. Use that as an example. Okay, well, I can use that as an example because when my son, I mean, I, I left D.C. in 1996 and went to Florida and didn't do business up there again. I started, I sold everything I had other than 2100 and I, in a hotel I had at 9th and F Street, but I sold everything else because I felt that the city had changed and it was no longer a place where black businesses could thrive. And I wanted to go and do more. And so I left. And, and so when my son, you know, grew up and he was born in DC and he wanted to go and re-engage in DC, we competed for an RFP project on fifth and I and won it. And one of the things I proposed doing, which wasn't a requirement, but I proposed building affordable housing, 60 units of affordable housing, on the parking lot of my office building in Anacostia. And we just, and my son decided to do it for senior citizens because those are the people who fought the most for us, who worked the hardest, 
and they need to be able to have their, their, their older years, their golden years with dignity. And to my surprise, when I went down to testify the city council, there were a group of people from Anacostia that were opposed to affordable housing, saying they didn't want any more affordable housing in Anacostia, and that they wanted to see uh, market rate housing and opposed us. One of the, a the ANC opposed us multiple times and made us reduce the size of the project. Yeah, from six like to one. Units. Yes. Yeah, man. And, and, and so, and I'm saying, what's the problem here? And I, I mean, I've been away from DC a long time, so I couldn't figure it out. We're building oh, affordable housing. I mean, I couldn't believe it. We're building affordable housing yeah. for our people in Anacostia for our seniors and the ANC and the, com and, 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 and the people who were from the community testifying were white, one guy from France. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is our city and we need to provide senior citizen housing for our, for our people. And so that project yeah. never got going and never got built because we had constant opposition yeah. to it. And, and that's crazy you say that, Donald, I don't mean to cut you off, but I got a notice yesterday, I believe, that the same commission uh, was voting uh, to change the zones so not to put any more apartments uh, in Anacostia in a particular area, right? Because yeah. they want more homeowners, right, to boost their value. And I was, you know, I thought to myself, right, I understand what you're saying. You want to boost the value of your home. I'm a home. I own several houses in, in Ward 8. But the reality is that if that you take that house and put that house in Northwest that you paid $500,000 for, it'll be eight hundred to $2 million. And so you 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 get an advantage for buying your property on this side of the river, right? So let's not act like you didn't know what was going on before you moved. Right. And then you get here, you don't you, you don't want to be a part of the growth in the community. You want to dictate what's going to happen. We we want to take all suggestions, but we want to be inclusive of everybody. Right. Yeah, they want to move people out. It's called gentrification. And I think that that's I mean, look, the biggest point of racism and the biggest example of racism is the fact that houses in Ward Three are more valuable than there are in Ward 8. And that's because many in the white community don't want to live amongst us. And, and, and no, and, and Don, it ain't just the white community. It's some of us that don't want to live amongst us. You, I agree with you. And <laughs> I think that we are all better off if we live in a very diverse environment and get to know each other better. And I think that would solve a lot of the conflicts that we have today. But I mean, to my surprise, I mean, I was not even going to make any money off of the senior citizen housing. We were going to lose money on it. But it was my commitment. I wanted to, I said, I got this land sitting there. Let's put it to use um, for something good. And I was very surprised and taken aback. But ultimately, I believe that affordable housing ought to be developed and owned by people reflective of the occupants of affordable housing. We cannot keep having people from more affluent areas or outside of the city come in and make money off of owning property um, for in our communities for us. And so my view is that if it, I mean, there's this the grading criteria, for example, of awarding these subsidies or tax credits is based on experience. So if you have a 450 year head start, which is what white people in this country have, then they're always going to be the most experienced. It's hard for us to ever get the experience. So we have to be willing to say that we're going to evaluate whether someone can perform and give them a chance, give them an opportunity, because this game of saying the most qualified, the yeah. best capable is. So we know, not, we, we, we know that. Yeah, we've seen it happen, man. We're historically, we're redlining in the community and, and people have not been able to access uh, loans based on their zip codes or their last names or, or their, or, you know, social security numbers starting with this. And so one of the things we want to start and we need your help, Don, you know, you've, cause you've made it, made it out. You know, they, you know, they say, uh, that you, you, you become successful, but one of the things you want to start is, is, um, a wealth building class, right? We're building these recreation centers in Ward 8. We have uh, four in a pipeline, one in uh, Congress Heights behind Rehoboth and MLK elementary school, uh, Anna Costi in the back of Ketchum, uh, one in Furby Hope uh, in Washington Highland, and one um, in, in Henson Ridge. And one of the things, we don't just want to focus on recreation, right? Rec we know we, we can play sports all day, right? But even you see the athletes, they go broke, 
because they don't have the financial literacy or the information on how to make their money grow and keep their money. And so inside of these recs, we want to create institutions of higher learning that's going to help us with careers and entrepreneurship and, 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 and home ownership inside of these institutions. We want to build that out. We want to lean on the great Don peoples, right? The usual expertise and your wisdom to come help us build that, man. Is this something you'll be interested in helping us with? Absolutely. Right. Um, DC is my home. Um, it is a place I got my start and I owe DC a debt I can never repay. And, um, and part of why I've, you know, tried hard to do more new business in DC, um, was because it's my hometown. I, and I love the people in DC and I'm, my son's a third generation Washingtonian and, uh, and I feel that there's so much unfinished business um, in D.C. And Matt was one of the reasons I considered running for mayor. Because Marion had taken us as far as he could. And it's about, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So he didn't have anybody to hand the baton to. And so I felt that that, is, that was something I should have done. And I regret not running for mayor of Washington. You really, man? You know, they say people that's, that's at that level don't want to really be involved in politics because you're under scrutiny. They're watching everything you do. And so, you know, it's a catch-22. Oh, but I've been, I mean, see, what people don't understand is to be a black business person and climb the ladder like I have. Yeah. I've been a target my whole life. Oh, absolutely. So I saw, I I saw the legal proceedings from your, from your deal on 2100. You also have a property right here off of uh, Atlantic Street by Smitty's that you're building. Before you go on, tell us a little bit about, th about that. Well, no, I, that must be my son. So, yeah. yeah but so, so look, I, I, I'll tell you that what I saw is every time Marion Barry and a black business person tried to advance in the 1980s, the Washington Post came after us and they made us targets. So I've been a target my whole life. And by the way, I wouldn't rule out running for office at some point in time because I think those of us who can should. Okay. And, you know, I got nothing to hide. I'm not afraid. And, uh, you know, um, and, and and I just believe that more of us. That's why I back you because you're the next generation. You're you are going to be the custodian of what happens to our future. And so, and also, people need to move out and make way for the next generation. But I know that one of the things I've admired most about you is that you're a fighter, that you're not afraid, and that you speak your mind. And that has made you a target too. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> and and so. I mean, and I tell people that happens anytime a black woman or man decides that they're going to knock down some barriers or they're going to challenge the status quo. Absolutely. And I admire that you fought um, hard for the project across from 2100. What is it, Reunion Square? Was that yeah, what it was? man. You it saw that? It's some economic inclusion. Oh, and man. Yeah. Mad. yeah, we had a. a you been fighting for people. Met. Yeah. Most of these politicians would have been fighting to put one of their friends in that. Man, come on. And man. instead, you were fighting for our people. I said, man, how, got, how we got a how we got a community benefit agreement and Anna Costia? It was two hundred fifty thousand dollars at the time. I think we got up to one point three million um, in that project. And I'm like, and what I did was I, I made the developers carve out a piece so the community can invest in it through equity and through uh, crowdfunding. The way when they look up 10, 15 years from now, that's not, that's not the building in war. They, that's my building. You own a percentage of that company or that hotel or that, that apartment or that office building in war. And so we're working on that as well, man. So we're looking to do some innovative things like that in the war, Don. We, uh, we, we're grateful to have you. Uh, well, you. Uh, we called, you answered, you showed up. Uh, and we, we appreciate you, man. We know that you are pressed for time. Um, we want to give an opportunity to share any last remarks with the public who want to know, you know, how they can just get on the path of wealth building and get out the, the cycle of poverty. Because poverty is a cycle. I remember Malcolm said, uh, you you get a poor education. And I, even in that CBA, I made sure they fund the local schools uh, in and around that project. How you got a project happening in Anacostia with a community benefit agreement and you ain't include the schools, man? Come on. Or the local sports or learning organizations or the community-based organizations. And so I got a lot of put. You saw the article? They were trying to beat me up. I know. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I, I take it. But, but you have to know that you're fighting for the right thing and people oh, yeah. know it. And, see, and, uh, that's, my, that's my man, Murray Burry, right there. That's when he was younger. Like, DeMont Pender. Uh, the black Picasso painted that man. I got my man William Lockers on that side. All right. So yeah, I always look for inspirations. Shout out to my man James Bunn too.
Yeah, well, look, I'll tell you. So, I mean, my, my parting thoughts are that never has there been a time since the 1960s where our agenda has been on the forefront of discussion, especially during this last presidential election. Yeah. Joe Biden would be on his beach house right now in, room, in Rehoboth, Delaware, and not in the White House if it weren't for our people. So he owes his presidency to us. He owes um, a commitment to our agenda. So this is our time. And we need to expect and demand. We need to make the ask. And we need to make constant ask from our president and our leadership locally. Yep. This is our city and it's our time. And there's never been a better moment in time for us since the 1980s, early 1980s. And so this opportunity in this time has been 30 plus years in the making. Yep. So now it's time for us to step up, let ourselves be heard, make our demands and go out and do business and people need to do business, come to you for support, come to me and my fund for support, but we need to change the generational cycles of poverty that our people confront. And so all of us need to do our part to change that by wealth building. That's right. And we need to empower black businesses who will provide economic opportunities for other black entrepreneurs. And that's what we need to do. And we need to get to that now. And we need to hold anyone that's right. who is in elected office accountable for Everyone. failing to do that. Yeah. And we have shown that we can elect presidents. Now, we've elected two presidents, Obama and Biden. And Biden owes us more than Obama. Man. And it's time to, to, to collect from him and go down there to 1350 Pennsylvania Avenue and collect there too. Yep, I thank you, Donda. Before you go, three books you suggest for the public to read. It don't have to be about real estate. Some three of your favorite books you recommend to the to the listening audience. First book I would recommend would be "Watch the White Guys Have All the Fun." Okay, um, and that's by Reg. That was Reginald Lewis's uh, biography. He designed some of the streets, right? Pardon me. He designed the streets. Yeah, you know, no, Reginald Lewis was Beatrice Foods. He was the first black billionaire. He, and, and it's a great story. Um, and so I'd recommend that book. Is that the um, same guy got the, the, the uh, museum in Baltimore? Exactly. Yeah, he was a designer. Yeah. Uh, he was designing some of the architecture in this area. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so that would be the first book I would read. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, a, um, a, another book that people um, ought to read is Mayor for Life. Um, because it tells them about the political history. Um, and, um, and then I think they should read, if they're interested in business, they should read my book, The People's Principles. Okay. Um, it's a lot about DC and it's a lot about how to create wealth. Um, and from nothing, because that's what I started off with no money. I had a sense of work ethic and, and values and faith in God. But wow, that's three things right there. Work ethic, values and faith in God, man. It's a bad combination. <laughs> but no bad means good I know what you mean I know exactly what you mean <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for having me thank you man I, I appreciate it and thank you for all you're doing to fight yeah. for our people and, yeah, thank you, brother. and you keep fighting and we're, I'm there with you I appreciate you man we look forward to hearing from Don Jr. Uh, next week I know he's on travel right now but I know he has a wealth of knowledge to share and, and those who are listening uh, you can log off Don you got two three minutes you can answer some of the questions in the comments they're looking for you in the comments, okay. uh, I'm going to continue to wrap up here. So, again, if you're just joining us, my name is Treyon White. I serve as a councilman right here in Washington, D.C., in the Great Ward 8. And we're trying to figure out ways to empower uh, and liberate our people through information sharing. I think that we don't do that enough. You know, I often conversate in different circles. And the conversation be about sports, news, females, just a bunch of nothingness. And I think that we have to change the, the, di the dynamics of our conversation. I, I want to give a special shout out to Community Connor Stewart's. I don't know if you checked them out, but you have to follow them on Instagram. They do an Instagram live uh, every week. Um, I think, t t t what's the day? They had uh, Big G and Juan Glover. But every week they have somebody on there giving information and knowledge 
uh, about uh, economic empowerment, about uh, raising children, building um, leaders in the community, how to, you know, keep your kid on the right tra track, um, where to invest. They have all these uh, great speakers and information sharing at Community Con Schools. It's on Instagram. I want to empower you to check them out. Some very powerful uh, brothers. I know we have uh, Nico, Charles, Mike, and they, they building a, a big team of influencers in that space and make sure you check them out. We are going to continue this. This is the first of many conversations. Uh, we had, we were joined by um, Mr. Dunn and brother Don Peoples today, but we're going to keep this dialogue going. I want to use my platform to, to use your platform to come on and talk about empowering our minds in this community because we, we, we're dying. You're talking about health disparities. You're talking about poor eating habits. You're talking about diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, uh, even us dying from COVID-19. You name it, we have it. And so we have to change the conversation so we can start changing the, the actions of our of our people. And we're running out of time. D.C., uh, I said all the time, used to be Chocolate City. You heard Don talk about it. Um, and we had a population 75% African-American. Now we are under 47%. And the population is shrinking and shrinking. And shrinking, and so we have to, you know, rethink how we want to grow and be fruitful. But we got to get in touch, contact with our spiritual beings, man, and who we are as a spirit. We put a lot of emphasis and time on our, what we do on the outside, from our hair to our clothes to our shoes to the belts to earrings, and those things are, you know, they they are what they are. But it's more important what you put on the inside, because what you put on the inside is going to last, and what you're teaching yourself. What happens you are developing and what you are depositing to your children, your nieces, your nephews, your cousins, those right outside your door each and every day so that your voice may echo in eternity because we only here for a brief moment and we gone. And we have to capitalize on those moments. And so we're signing off, we're logging off tonight, but stay engaged. Uh, to get on our list service is Trayon White, T-R-A-Y-O-N, White, W-H-I-T-E, the number 8.com, TreyonWhite8.com to get the information what we're doing to uplift and empower our community because you want to see more businesses open up on Goho Road, MLK, Southern Avenue, Alabama Avenue. And we want to get you to become those business owners. We can shop and spend our own money. And shout out to the entrepreneurs, man. I, during this pandemic, I've seen so many people start their businesses through social media, and we have to support each other. Brother Rollo pulled up. Just yesterday, around my way, Narallo, you know, came a little late, but he came with some with, with some uh some of his gear. Um, so check brother Rollo Rollo out um and some of his gear, pushing love in the community. Shout out to Love More, so many different great museums, so many different brands that that, that is out right now. Um, that that we need to be supporting. Um, and, and it's it's nothing like taking your money and reinvesting it. I don't want to say in a black business, but investing in yourself. Because that's somebody who represents you and your community. Because our dollar exits the community and within a minute. Well, we see other dollars circulating 20 to 30, 40 times in our own community. So we got to start owning businesses in our community. And I'm, I'm not a, afraid to say it. I'm unapologetic about it, about empowering each other. each other. And we can't wait on the government to do it. And I, and I totally believe that we as a government have to create policies and vehicles to empower people. But guess what? We are our own solution. $1.3 trillion a year we spend. Because we put a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of that into something and watch it grow. So we're signing out, guys. I want to thank you for having me. I'm Treyon White. You can follow me at Treyon White on Instagram, Facebook, whatever other social media. Twitter, I don't tweet much, but maybe I, maybe I will. Make sure you leave your information in the con If you have a business, if you have an Instagram, if you have uh, a real estate company, uh, if you are a mortgage company, leave it in the comments. Leave it in the comments. We want to send the, the information from this uh, platform we're building out into the community so we can support you. If you have a business, if you have, uh, um, if you aspire to have a business, we want to support you too. We have classes on how to start a business, or we just did two, we did three sessions on nonprofit management. We have several different, in fact, I was talking to Kim Ford today from Arthur's Table that's going to be doing grants for the community. 
So I'm just giving, I'm just stalling to give you time to put your business into the chat so people can follow you, uh, so people can support you um, in the chat. Uh, so I see point of kid, child care, Ramona Barber. Uh, I see Sweet Zuri, um, Aisha's Henna, Boogie Fetish LLC, developers Jason and Kendra, Gray Crown Investments. Excellent. Join our discussion. We meet every Monday at 430 to figure out how to get businesses from the community involved in projects in D.C. A1 Finisher, Barber Home Group. Um, okay. Inbound Customer Service at Eng Engle Virtual Solutions at gmail.com. Make sure you put that .com unless it's XOM. I'm reading it wrong. Um, Joe. We fit DC. What's up, Joe? Make sure you put uh, Shark Tank Boxing, Pastor John. Um, some type of uh, tour around the community will be highlighting uh, uh, businesses of color. In the community, I'm gonna start that sometime in um, May, June. Um, we're gonna highlight your business. So if you have a business, send to us so we can highlight your business. Um, Seven fifty-five puts the club close up at eight o'clock. That's it for us, you guys. Take care. Have a blessed night. See you next time. Good Friday. That all. See you next time, guys. One.